champion Amicia, he now runs ELA's Art, basically championing the patronage between visual artists and brands within the 21st century. So he's going to talk to us a bit about that and then introduce Lydia, um, who's going to be doing her live performance art for us today. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Uh, how's the mic? Good? Yeah. Awesome. Um, so yeah, before I start, I wanted to um, well, thank MEC, first of all, for the opportunity to be here today. Uh, it's really nice and it's, it's, it feels really special to be back here because I've experienced a lot here and I'm really happy to be back. Uh, I wanted to introduce first uh, Lilius Buchanan, who's uh, an artist and uh, illustrator uh, who recently uh, had a residency at the Royal Academy uh, and so today will be working live for you guys to reinterpret and reimagine the EMC fuel uh, identity, so to speak. Cool. Um, so I wanted to, before starting to talk about what we do as a company, um, I wanted to give a little bit of background about why this company has come to be and a bit of background about art and patronage more generally, because I think it's, it's quite an interesting story. Um, I mean, art patronage has existed for centuries and centuries. Uh, and historically, the way it used to work is rich, probably non-commercial patrons used to, to commission artists. And that happened with the church, for example, with the Pope commissioning Michelangelo to be the Sistine Chapel. And the objective was really to enhance the visibility of the patron and also give back to the community in a way that basically art and, um, and creativity can do. Now, while the commissioning model or commissioning itself hasn't necessarily changed that much until today, what has changed is who actually does commit this commission. Um, and I really like this example, which is, um, which is as you see, the, the Swatch Art Peace Hotel. Um, whereas it was kind of the rich patrons and uh, individuals of the past that used to commission artists, today you're increasingly seeing brands come forward uh, and look to partner with relevant artistic talent to use art on product, to use art in their offices, or even to just get inspired by working with artists um, that bring a completely different perspective to their business. Um, and I mean, Swatch started their artistic collaboration quite a long time ago. I mean, you're probably familiar with Keith Haring working in partnership with Swatch to develop kind of the, the internals. Um, they've continued doing that, they've continued uh, working with artists, but more recently, in 2005, they opened this in Shanghai. Um, and what's quite unique about this place is, yes, it's a hotel, so it serves as a hotel, but there's a floor that is dedicated to artist residencies. And Swatch work to bring in the best talent that they can find into that residency, and they work collaboratively with artists. Sometimes they exhibit their work there, sometimes if they really like something, they'll come and commission the artist and work with that artist to work on a watch piece or on a marketing campaign with them. So it's what I really like about this is um, Swatch working really collaboratively uh, with the artists. And, you know, today this doesn't necessarily only happen on product. Uh, I don't know how many of you guys went to um, to the Barbican last year for Revolutions, uh, which was basically a, a show about how digital is changing the landscape of visual arts. And um, Intel and Vice created this piece, um, which which was a very interactive. Uh, piece of artwork. So yes, there is commissioning and there is artists working with companies within the physical space, but the digital space, which is probably increasingly relevant within a media setting, is something that artists are not, um, are very comfortable with actually, and increasingly so. Um, so we've looked a bit about kind of how brands and how historically patrons have commissioned artists, but from the artist standpoint, I mean, this guy was, was one of the precursors of of working and using kind of popular culture as an inspiration to some of his works. Um, and be that through kind of his Campbell Soup's um, artworks, 
or the creation of the factory, which basically enabled a couple of artists to come together and create work collaboratively, and which resulted in Jean-Michel Basquiat becoming who Jean-Michel Basquiat is today. Um, he was really one of the precursors in this, uh, in this space. Today, you probably would say this guy, uh, Murakami, has kind of taken that lantern or that flambeau, as you say in French, and, and kind of pushed it forward um, and created an agency himself called Kai Kai Kiki, where he works and has hired six or seven or more artists that he's very comfortable with working, that can deliver on time, on brief, on budget. And those guys work very closely with a number of different brands to create artworks, to create installations, all under the expert and curational eye of, of Murakami. So you'll tell me, well, this is all great. I mean, brands are working with artists, artists are working with brands, everybody's getting paid, everybody's making money, everybody's grabbing customers' extensions, it's all working great. And actually, thinking about it, in 1964, yeah, you'd say maybe that's quite true. Uh, this was a letter that would be that the uh, product marketing manager of Campbell Soup sent to Andy Warhol, which in a nutshell says, we really love what you're doing, you're too expensive for us to buy your artwork today, but please keep doing what you're doing because we really love your stuff. They also mentioned that he likes Campbell Soup, which is good. Now, today what you're seeing is a reversal of this thing, um, mostly because of changes in copyright law, which I'm not going to touch on. It's a topic of an essay I've written, which you can check out on ELX.com. But as a result of copyright changes, often what you'll have is if an artist decides to use a brand, a brand logo, a, a product, uh, they will quite quickly receive a legal note saying, please stop using this artwork. It's private property. Uh, if not, we can take it to court. This bar, a couple of very famous artists, you'll take Damien Hurst, recent work for Disney and creating the out. Um, all of these kind of very, very famous artists don't have these problems, but the majority of artists are not the kind of world famous, world leading artists. And your emerging talent doesn't necessarily have the support or the knowledge about the law um, to be able to value this stuff very constructively. And so you can imagine kind of the death of the artist um, today really, really struggling with, on the one hand, government cuts, lack of opportunities, um, the reliance on new ways to work, i.e. they need to work with commercial patrons to be able to survive. And a recent study done by the Artist Network showed that only 20% of galleries pay artists to put up their work in the gallery, which is a huge problem. And on the other hand, if they do work with commercial brands and commercial patrons to get their name out there, how do they manage this kind of copyright space? Um, so that's quick kind of build background. So I think today, you know, we're in a space where artists are extremely well versed to be able to work on a number of different mediums. They're extremely confident um, when it comes to their creative practice, um, but they have a lot of difficulty when it comes to working within the commercial space, which is increasingly important for them to survive. On the flip side, brands are extremely passionate about reaching and engaging their customers in meaningful ways. And they're also very hungry for the opportunity to tell stories in a way that is really, really subtle. And by merging the artistic quality and the artistic integrity to the business savvy of businesses, I think that there can be a real opportunity to generate some outstanding partnerships um, that benefit not only um, the artist, but also the, the modern day 21st century patron, i.e. brands and businesses. So that's essentially why we created um, ELX Art. Um, and what I'll do is maybe show you a quick little video um, to, to kick us off about what we do. Throughout history, patrons have commissioned artists to translate their ideas. 
different technology. As the popular artist, Nicky Leo had an affinity. These collaborations are now considered to be landmarks in our history. The relationship between artist and patron is of immensely high value, but it is also fragile. Such partnerships can reach a universal audience if managed correctly. This is where we are at specialized. We match make artists and brands who have the right chemistry. The relationship is managed carefully. We protect the integrity of the artist as well as the interest of the patron to ensure the success of collaborative projects. Our projects are either artist led, but artist has a little idea that requires brand support, or patron led, or brand has a problem with our idea that artists can respond to. We provide a one and a management service that benefits both artists and patrons. BLS is an alternative to professional advertising that supports artists and creates inspiring, emotive content. So, I'll break this down quite simply. Um, you know, our, our ethos is, is really about creative culmination. Um, it stems from, from kind of the bee, uh, the bee concept whereby bees are the number one pollinators of the planet and they basically take pollen and they spread it um, by carrying it on their backs and on their bodies once they've landed in a flower. Um, we believe in creative pollination in the sense that we believe that there can be and that we can engineer the right chemistry for a commercial patron and an artist to work collaboratively together and to create some really outstanding work. We have basically two ways in which we do this, which um, was explained in the video, but I'll, I'll break it down really simply. On the one hand, either uh, a brand can come and say, I have a problem. I would like my shoe or my product to be completely re reimagined by an artist. And then we would brief that artist and select the right kind of artist to respond to that brand brief. The other way to work is working with the artist that we have or working with some of the art partners that we have. We create products or packages that we look to sponsor and that we look to find partners that will invest to be able to make those creative projects a reality. So essentially, the business model is very simple. It is, on the one hand, either a brand can commission an artist, or a brand can sponsor a creative project. And what we do is, throughout any project that we undertake, is we create kind of documentary audiovisual content that tells, that tells the story of the collaboration from kind of inception all the way to the final output. And that's through photo and video. And just to, 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 to kind of take the point home, I think from uh, talking to you guys, I think it's important that art, and visual art specifically, doesn't only have a place in the gallery or in the museum. Visual artists are very comfortable, as I mentioned, working on a number of mediums and in, in a different number of genres. And their work can be applied on products, such as the Swatch Key Pen, the example I mentioned, to in-store, to comms, to live events, to websites, to packaging. I mean, the way in which uh, you can brief an artist or work with an artist is, is really, really broad. Um, what we're here to do is essentially play a translation service to enable the brand speak to come in and be translated into artist speak so that the artist feels excited and then the artist's work is then back transferred into brand speak so that there's really a, a strong sense of communication and understanding between two disciplines that have historically been sometimes at odds with each other. Um, so maybe I can show you a couple of case studies of, 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 the, of the work we've done. I mean, we set up BLX in late 2013, um, and the first year we've done about four or five projects, and this year we've already done two. Uh, this is just a quick snapshot of, of some of the ones that I think might be, uh, might be interesting to you guys. Um, the first one is, is um, work we did with Dokken Company. The Dokken Company is a marble table manufacturer. And they produce beautiful tables and beautiful products, but they have no design skills. 
and they didn't know what the tables should look like. So we worked with a sculptor and visual artist to come up with these three designs that were then that could then be applied on marble. So all of these colors that he uses are colors that can be found in stone and that can be basically applied to create a product that then goes to market and is retail. Um, the other thing we've done is a um, is space making. So um, we worked with three artists, um, two street artists and one botanical artist, and we took a space in Shoreditch, uh, which was basically a dump, and we cleared the whole space out. Uh, the, the owner was very kind enough to give us the space for free for three months, and um, and basically we approached a company, um, a, a beer company, Piston Head Lager, uh, and asked them whether they would be interested in sponsoring or putting on a show with us. And they said, well, yeah, but, you know, we're, we've got a skull in our brand identity. Um, we, we like quite heavy hitting, hard rock stuff. We need something that's going to speak to our audience. Uh, not, it's not just an art show, it needs to bridge, bridge that gap. And so that's where we then headhunted and worked with a relevant artist to do that. Finding really two street artists that are focused on kind of dark imagery, skulls, etc., and one botanical artist that could bring a little bit of a touch of light um, to, to the exhibition. And, uh, and, and I'm happy to say, I mean, this happened in June last year, that uh, about half of the pieces um, that we put on there sold, and uh, Piss and Head worked uh, really closely with us and, and did quite a really good social media campaign uh, with, uh, with regards to auctioning some of the pieces, also giving access in terms of uh, interviews with the artists and bringing some of their key clients to witness how the brand was associated itself with, with creativity in the art world. Um, we also work on more kind of design um, logo kind of work. Uh, this is something that we've recently done for a members club in, um, in Mayfair. Uh, so logo development, very much focused on this, this character that's, that's called Mimi's, who's kind of a rebellious um, young kid that doesn't really that that wants that that's kind of cooler than cool and um, and that's kind of a more traditional way that you might see kind of a design agency working but we have the breadth now of, of artists to really respond to that um, and then finally in terms of case studies um, a project we've done with um, with Unleash uh, I don't know if there's any ravers or colors uh, in in the audience today but. Um, they put on uh, events every month um, for, for that kind of community. And we worked with two of our artists to create all of their flyer communication on Facebook, and then uh, quite an interesting piece of artwork that worked in the clubs, uh, which I'll show you now. So you can just to show kind of the variety of the different artists that we work with. to kind of more digital, technology-based artists. So the range of work we can do with these guys is pretty varied and pretty broad. Uh, and this is the last artist that we've, we've recently um, started working with, um, called Paul Friedlander. A uh, really interesting guy who, um, who does kinetic structures and sculptures. Uh, essentially, it's, um, it's a device where you can project anything you want onto it, and it really brings the kind of the more the movement of the objects to life in, in, uh, in association with, with projection. So it works really well for events, but also works really well for like corporate headquarters uh, and other things like that. Um, and finally, to, to kind of close the, the, the elements of what we do, as you've seen kind of the, the commissioning side of the, of the business in terms of the different partnerships we've, we've done, um, we also have developed three different sponsorship opportunities and three unique kind of exclusive artistic platforms uh, for which we're looking 
to find the right partner. Um, I can go into detail about this, but I won't because I don't have time. Um, but essentially, Valentina is a it's an Italian comic strip uh, focused on erotica and fashion. Uh, and they're looking to take this character into London uh, either this year or next year and, uh, and basically bring this character to life in a very unique way. Uh, Walford is involved uh, with them from a kind of lingerie point of view, uh, but we'd love to work with other partners to be able to bring this character um, to life. Art Walls is an opportunity we've built with um, Global Street Art. Uh, giving us access to 40 plus different walls in East London uh, where artwork can be commissioned and we can do a kind of a great piece of storytelling or kind of a route through East London by using different walls and different artists to create a brand story through that journey. And finally, Future Collectibles is probably the flagship um, property that we have. We've developed this for four or five months now and it's essentially a commissioning model to imagine how objects that are today just physical objects can be embedded with digital in a way that enhances the value of that object. Um, so that you can imagine, for example, a ring, rather than, than offering an engagement ring to your future wife as a diamond, this ring, for example, could have a miniature projector connected to a satellite and that picks up the luminescence of a star. And whenever that star is in orbit, over your city or wherever you are, that pixel will light up based on the luminescence that that, that star is giving to the projector. Um, so that's it for me. I'll leave you with a video of, um, of one of the artists that we are collaborating with uh, for future collectibles. And, um, and then I'll probably take, hopefully, a lot of questions and a lot of feedback and stuff you want to ask me about. sourcing these, these incredible talents and working with them on, on the projects we do. Um, but that goes from kind of going to a lot, a lot, a lot of different art shows, uh, to all of the degree shows at the different uh, universities in, in London, uh, and also to working with some of the more kind of executional partners that we work with, like Global Street Art, like Happiness Company, uh, and like Create Moves to kind of broaden our net uh, and, and find the relevant artists because not all artists will be able to work in a commercial setting uh, for a number of different reasons. I have a question about art and uh, patronage and funding of arts in Germany. Do you think there is a problem with big business funding artistic institutions. So a recent example would be at BP, I think they, they have a big sponsorship with the Tate. Do you think it matters 
that Tate accept that was like, not dirty money, but you know, money from an institution that is uh, not necessarily most credible in terms of its environmental um, output? Or do you think at the end of the day, money is money when it comes to funding art? Look, I mean, I'm the business side of the other so honestly, I think if the brand, whatever brand that is, has a strategy that is clear in terms of how they're going to partner with the institution and what kind of projects they're going to undertake with that institution, then I don't think it's an issue. I think, you know, there have been brands that have been in the shits and that have come out of those because of partnering and because of reimagining their brand. So I think, you know, no, I have no problem with that. Uh, I have no problem with that. But I would say that it, it takes it takes courage and it takes working very closely with that art institution to find the way in which to do it in the right way. I have a question. Uh, yes. You talk about courage. Um, I think coming from a sort of a place where you had a stable job, obviously you were at MEC before. How um, did, was the idea conceived to make this a business venture, and what did it take to move into that and to make it happen as a reality for you? I mean, when I was at MEC, I worked at, at MEC Access, which which is a, the partnership kind of division. So in that sense, there is a fit. Um, but I think it just takes, like, honestly, just dedication and and feeling okay, like just being able to pick yourself up really easily and often. Because um, you know, when you have a, a stable job, uh, I guess if your computer starts to do something wrong, you pick up the phone and you dial IT, uh, or when the legal contract that you're trying to get between two Ted and Doers, for example, which I worked on when I was here, you call the legal guy and you say, can you have a look at this? Uh, when you're doing your own business, you don't have those people. Um, so I think it's just taking, it, it, it forces you to just learn a lot of stuff that you didn't think you would ever need to know. <laughs> I would want to tell. In your in your success so far within your business, personally and professionally, what is your sort of proudest moment? What's your project that you kind of really think showcases the reason why you went and set up your own business to celebrate art and to bring it closer to brands? Mm, that's a good question. Um, it's gonna be a weird answer, but I'd say the, the first example, um, the tables, were probably the thing I'm the proudest of because um, because it, it had all of the elements of what we want to be doing. It had finding the right brand that has a problem. It had looking at the artist that could answer that problem. It had then brokering the relationship between the two. It then had the element of production of artwork and managing the client as the production of artwork happens. And then it had the actual production of a physical product that's going into retail. And from a, putting my financial hat on, it had the three things that we can make money on, which are kind of brokerage fees, man project management, and royalties. And it enabled the artist to get paid across all of those verticals that are really important for artists. So that's, yeah, it's a lot of really nice to do. But yeah. Do, do you face a challenge where brands, I suspect, probably more popular brands, treat artists or the creativity as a commodity? So where is this instead of blurring line between content, so there's a bad, but it's content. Yes. I'm a brand, right? I do like a marketing, I do just really want to be yeah. versus creating art and therefore it's having a different and a political and having value. Yeah, I see. Or if not now, do you think that might yeah. come down the line? I think it'll definitely happen. Um, and I think that's where we need to pick the artists very carefully to respond to particular bad needs. 
because some artists... The brand's going to cancel you as well, probably. Yeah, although, I mean, at the end of the day, we, we can be more picky on the artist side than we can be on the brand side, if I'm honest. Um, but yeah, that, that will happen. And to be honest, the, the benefit for brands in working in this model is the audiovisual content, is the relationship with, with the artist. So, yeah, that will that'll be a problem, but, but I think if, if the brand's clear with us, then we can be clear with the artist. And if it doesn't fly for him, then tough. Uh, but yeah, it's not all brands will have, and, and they shouldn't have artistic integrity as part of what they want to be striving for. So it's, 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 a, it's an adjunct to yeah. the potential of commoditization, or so yeah. it's an adjunct you know, as a brand. And as a, yeah. 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 yeah, and that's, yeah. that's, that's going to be a really hard struggle for us in terms of ensuring that the ethos of what we're doing stays um, stays right, um, probably. Probably going to be some success too, so you might be wrong. Yeah? How do you see yourselves as a business? Like, obviously you're now quite a small and tight and dynamic team. Is that what, like, where you see yourself staying in that space? Or are you kind of vision of my life to grow big and take the world by the storm. So when you see that, that's fine. Um, I, I, I have this conversation this morning um, with uh, investors. Um, I would say that we grow slowly at first um, because our business is not a hugely scalable business. Um, we build trust. Because at the end of the day, that's what curation is going to be about. But the long-term play at some point is, yes, to, to be able to turn that switch while having the expertise and the background in, in matchmaking the right kind of artist and brand. But I don't expect us to be a crowdsourcing platform ever. Thanks, as, as, well, if, if you've got kind of the what we're doing now and kind of crowdsourcing, we'll probably want to be in the middle. Uh, uh, Mike, you come up with the idea of business. How did it happen? Was it just written flat? Was it slow? No, it's yeah, it took a while. It took a little bit. Well, it, for me, it was. I worked in for publicist and MBA and here, uh, and I just I was the count man, so I was always presenting really good ideas, but not often did they fully come from me. And I thought, well, let's try to bring these creatives up a little bit more. And I thought, well, the advertising agency is kind of that, but they don't. Uh, and then I was became quite passionate about the content space, uh, which. Uh, so it was a number of different facets that kind of came together and then I bumped into Jamie uh, here actually at NBC and we went for a pint and we're like, well, there's something there, uh, let's just start exploring it. Uh, and then it was probably three, four months after that we said, okay, let's, let's give it a go. Uh, I wouldn't have done it if I had kids or family. So, but also, did you, um, what's the transition from being a full time job? Did you do it part time and then, you know, how did you make the transition? I thought about it part time. I uh, conceptualized it part time, um, but I didn't actually do any real kind of getting brands involved, getting partners, getting artists. That, that came when we decided. I mean, a full-time job is a full-time job. It's really difficult. Like, you come home, I mean, you come home at 7.30, 8, you're knackered, you're dead. You, you want to watch TV or you want to go have a pint. Um, so, no. <laughs> so what is your day like now? So, how, how do you structure? Do you work together? Or do you like, kind of go off and do your business stuff then you look for artists and have some work? It's really fluid. I mean, um, we, at the moment, 
At the moment, we're in a pretty privileged position now, in the sense that we feel that we have a really strong roster of artists that can basically respond to any brief people who brought us. And we've got pretty really, really strong sponsorship opportunities. So right now, what we're doing is just meeting people and trying to sell the stuff. Thank you so much. That was no, absolutely amazing. Yeah. Anything we just say, and also the fantastic uh, artwork. Yes. Uh, yes. At the same time, it's absolutely wonderful. Thank you so, so much. But maybe just quick. I'm sure you'll be able to. Just... No, tell us. Yeah. Um, Tin Man, yeah. the Wizard of Oz, and it's the oil. Obviously, oil is fuel, and it's um, you know helping them get to the Emerald City where he finds his heart. Yeah. So <laughs> that's it. the idea. But also, you know, if you're stuck. Whatever creative project we're doing, just do some collage. It's really fun. <laughs> That's me. Thank you so much. Thank you.